Today we have the privilege of being with Dr. Joseph Prendergast, a premier endocrinologist from Palo Alto, California. We're delighted to have him talking about his breakthrough formulation of ProArginine Plus and arginine in general. Welcome, Dr. Joe. Good to be here, always. Um, Dr. Joe, tell us just briefly about your medical background. It's obviously very distinguished, but I think you could probably run through it faster than I could. <laughs> well, I uh, went through college in Williamstown, Massachusetts at Williams College, on then to medical school, uh, where I went to Wayne State University, where I was born in Detroit. After that, I went to uh, go through all the early uh, specialization, Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. And because of the riots there, as I was finishing up, I decided I was going to go to California, where I went to the University of California, San Francisco. And there, basically, I had a junior faculty position and a, a place where I was doing lots of research. So what led you into endocrinology? It was funny because I swore I never wanted to do that of all the specialists. But when I got to Henry Ford doing my first specialty, all the people in the Department of Endocrinology were stunningly good. Great clinicians, I never learned so much so fast in my life. They were great researchers and internationally they were thought to be unparalleled in terms of, of people who really could do things right. I've always wanted to be with really top flight people, which brings me here today. Oh, great. Well, we're, we're honored to have you with us. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I know from your background, because we've had a number of discussions before, is that your father, unfortunately, suffered a stroke at yeah. a young age, and that that event and his subsequent death 10 years later led you to be concerned about your right. genetic predisposition and the possibility of you having some sort of cardiovascular disease. Quite true, but of course, I was gonna beat it out. I was gonna exercise, I was gonna eat right, even though we didn't really know at that time that that would help, but I felt it would. And so with all the things that he had done badly, I was doing it very well, and yet it wasn't enough. We had a bad gene, and we didn't talk about it in those days. It just was too much. So the gene situation, there is a very significant impact on a person's uh, possibility of having cardiovascular disease, heart attack, stroke, yeah, diabetes, etc., through the genetic tree. Absolutely. And with your father's situation, then w tell us about your own story going in and, and being tested and finding out that even though you had not done some of the things, probably not right. smoked or not uh, weren't right. overweight, you were exercising, you were an athlete, a successful athlete in high school and college, but even despite all of that, uh, what, what happened when you found out that you had a, a problem? What happened was I was seeing a good friend because I had a little funny pain recurrent in my stomach. He said, we need a CAT scan. We need to figure out what's going on in there. It might be a cancer, and I said, oh, okay. It wasn't a cancer, but it really was a lot of atherosclerosis. And I can remember standing behind him, looking at the films as he flipped them up and down all the time and thinking, oh, he's taking a long time. And what is this? It looks like there's snow all over the x-rays. And he said, look at you, no cancer, but you've got the worst atherosclerosis I've ever seen in anyone your age. You look like you're 80 years old inside. And you were how old at the time? 37 years old. 37 years old. So that must have been a shocking revelation. Not after. only shocked for that, but I realized I'm in my father's footsteps. Tell us about what is the difference um, semantically between atherosclerosis and arterial sclerosis, which we seem to hear that right. term more often. And you know, it's very interesting because the difference is now becoming more important. As I learned and did reverse my atherosclerosis, in terms of what it did and was going to do to me, we now realize there's a second one. And I knew this since medical school, but I didn't realize the impact because then they say it doesn't matter. It's just the arteries are hard. As you get older, they're supposed to get hard. hard. And you're in a situation where you need not worry about this because it won't do what the plaque does, won't do what everything does when you fill up your cholesterol and you get calcification and all the bad things that we think of today from eating too many hamburgers and the like. And what you're in is a situation where we can correct both of these with the L-arginine. What a good piece of luck that was. So 
essentially 36 years ago, you discovered you had atherosclerosis, and that led you to the quest to finding out if there was a, a natural or any kind of medical or scientific discovery right. that could assist you in helping to overcome that genetic right. predisposition. Tell us a little bit about the quest since that 36 years, because obviously you're still with us. Yeah, and it, it came about through a relationship. I, I was working uh, working for the you know, pharmaceutical companies on the talk circuit. I would do something to talk about how people with diabetes could have their diabetes prevented. Now, we weren't doing a good job, but we were doing better than if you did nothing at all. On the other side of the table was a wonderful person who had just come to Stanford from Harvard, Victor Zhao. Victor Zhao runs all of Duke University right now. We still keep in contact, barely, but he is busy. He runs a giant institution, and it looks like he still does cardiovascular research. And he was doing some research, which I picked off on the internet. Now, that was a long time ago. But the internet was doing well to give physicians, and if they wanted to, other ordinary individuals the capacity to look up research. So I looked up what he was doing. 30 papers a year for the last two years on arginine reversing hardening of the arteries. And when was and that approximately, like, that Victor Zhao was first oh, publishing that on? This, this was back in about 90, 1990. 1990. Yeah. So for the previous 15 years, you just did what to try to help it from getting worse? I hope like mad I was doing the right thing. Increased my running. I was only doing two miles a day for a while and I increased it to five. I did weightlifting. I took all the herbs that I could finally uh, work with. I met with preventative medicine at Stanford, John Farquhar, head of the department, who really coined the phrase, you know, if you really work on your heart disease and take the right products, you can prevent an awful lot. And an awful lot was 30% at that time. Well, that was good enough for me because there's nothing else in a standard medicine. And he only did diet and exercise. So with diet and exercise, you were able to keep the atherosclerosis from resulting in a major heart attack or stroke or something of that nature from that period of time when you discovered it at 37 until you were about probably 52 or 3. Yeah. And then is when you learned about arginine. Tell us a little Correct. bit about... So from Victor Zhao, you heard about arginine yeah. and read about it. So what did you do? How did you start first taking arginine? Well, first of all, I asked Victor, what should I do? And he said, I don't know. I do rats and rabbits. Go over here to this guy, John Cook. He's the guy who knows how to take care of people. He's the one who sets up the research for that. So that's how my friendship with John uh, Cook became a really important thing in my life and still is. We still meet. We still like one another. And he has an interesting... Tell us, tell us about John Cook's Yeah, I was just going to say, he did everything I did. We, we didn't realize we came right through the same medical school, and he went to Mayo Clinic, I went to uh, Henry Ford, and he went to uh, other things, and he got a PhD, and I just got an MD. But we had uh, sort of linear experiences in all we were doing with our personal research throughout all these situations, and oddly enough, ended up on the same path for heart disease as well. So in the early 90s, John Cook was at Stanford. Following right. Victor Zhao's research, you got acquainted and, and caught up with John Cook, and then you started taking arginine. Tell right. us a little bit about that first arginine you were taking. Came from the bowels of Stanford. The pharmaceutical uh, world stored it down there. It was pure. It was everything, everything it was supposed to be, and I was so glad to get it. It wasn't until later that I realized that research in arginine in an academic situation depended very likely on using just arginine. Arginine only lasts a matter of seconds in your body. The fact that you can swallow a lot only lengthens the duration by virtue of absorbing it. But when you think about it, it was a miracle that when I was using it earlier that I didn't have a heart attack or stroke because as a product that will keep people alive without anything, it is not good all by itself. You have to have another product and I might say it's just like ProArginine Plus, that will go 24 hours, 36 hours, and be something that is very appropriate for a human being to stay away from atherosclerosis. And that brings us to the Nobel Prize, which is awarded in 1998 to three scientists, researchers, including Louis Ignero from UCLA, mm -hmm. where they determined that citrulline with the arginine 
would do what versus arginine by itself? Well, he made a big point of this and still does that that's the important part that will make the citrulline come with the arginine so the arginine can make more arginine and it burgeons into something that lasts a long time. 24 hours, 36 hours. How, does, do it, it. how does the body do that? What, does, what happens with arginine mm -hmm. and citrulline going to your body? Just describe that briefly. Well, there's, there's an enzyme that comes from arginine coming in to start with and it goes to the lining of the arteries, the endothelium, and this is one cell thick lining of the arteries, and with that it does its thing, but the L-citrulline goes in there and works with it, so to speak, and augments the production of the arginine that it makes. It doesn't make it as though this might be five grams per scoop, and it doesn't make it as though it's you know 20 grams per scoop, but the duration is what's important, and that's what it does. So what you're saying is that a person taking just arginine by itself has a very momentary reaction to the relaxation of the blood vessel, the nitric oxide that's produced by the lining of the heart or the lining of the vessels, which is called the endothelium. But when it's combined with citrulline, that they work together in having the endothelium create nitric oxide 24, 36 hours and what does the nitric oxide do to the endothelium that helps atherosclerosis? Well, it makes it normal. Endothelium, as we get older, as plaque get, builds up in there and gets into uh, the metabolism, uh, just is dysfunctional. And that's where the plaque can then make uh, uh, growth factors occur in there. It doesn't occur in the youth, even though growth is depending, depends an awful lot on the arginine as well as the citrulline in most situations. And we think that this may have a lot of other wonderful things that might do to augment growth and development early in childhood. This is a problem today that we're all worried about, autism uh, and a lot of other things that seem to be inappropriate and seem to be growing within the framework of things. So here we have something we now understand as a product for human beings that may be able to do a lot of special things that we didn't think it could before.